Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tom Mogorosi. I am the training coordinator of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. Welcome to the Cricket South Africa Level 2 umpiring course. As usual, I will be joined by my head of training, Abdullah Stienkamp, to take us through this course before I get into the agenda for this evening. I'm just going to go through the meeting protocols. The top protocol for the meeting as well as the rest of the course is for all microphones to be on mute and please turn off your camera. It is quite disturbing for presenters if there's background noise and it will also affect the hearing of other candidates. So please, especially if you join late, make sure that you join with your camera off and more importantly, with your microphone on mute. The session will follow the course of a presentation of laws for the first hour, and it will include revision questions from previous exam papers, level two and level three. And after the revision questions that Abdullah or I will go through, then we will open the floor to you guys to ask any questions. And we would like to ask that the questions asked in the Q&A section relate to the evening's material. If we open the floor up to any and every question based on cricket umpiring, we would be here all night and other candidates would lose interest. So please let's stick to the material that is presented on a particular lecture. You can, while we present, write down your question in the meeting chat box so that you don't forget your question and we will come to it during the Q&A section. When the Q&A session starts, raise your virtual hand, turn on your microphone when you are prompted, and you can also turn your camera on if you wish. And so there I'm hearing some background noise and I ask once again for all candidates to please put their microphones on mute. We might go over the finish time of 8 p.m. during the questions and answer session. That's not a problem. You're welcome to leave if you have to. Every session will be recorded and recordings will be emailed out to everybody on my mailing list at about an hour after the lecture ends. Please excuse me while I go and mute all participants as the background noise continues. All kindly, please all mute yourselves. Okay, back to the meeting protocols. Most important one being in red right at the top. Please put your microphone on mute and turn off your camera to save everybody's bandwidth. If you don't get to post your question or pose your question, uh, you can put it in the chat box during the Q&A. And if you leave before we have answered your question, we will answer your question and you can catch up on it on the recording. So this is the agenda for the course. Lecture one is today, and we are only going to cover in the entire course 20 laws in total. This evening we will cover law five, law nine, and law 11. I will take you through the first two, and Abdullah will take you through the last one, as well as the revision questions before we open up the floor to questions and answers. The reason that we're only presenting 20 laws is that the Cricket South Africa Level 2 exam only examines those 20 laws that we're going to cover. 
these slides you will see for those of you who have recently been on our online level one course that these are the same slides for the same laws. Uh, the, remember that the law never changes. OK, so what we are presenting to you is what will be examined in the level two exam and the revision questions that we are going to go through in the six lectures are going to be related to these laws and are also coming from previous exam papers from level two and level three cricket south africa exams um, and as you know like in any other subject uh, previous exam questions are quite often repeated in the new exam so please guys um, follow the revision questions carefully uh, try them on your own. We are going to be asking you to help us answer the revision questions instead of us just giving you the answers. OK, and that's how we're all going to learn together. On Monday, we're going to go through laws 12, 13, 14, 17, 18. And so we will cover all 20 laws up until law 41 on lecture 6, Monday, the 11th of July. We will have a revision lecture on Wednesday, the 13th of July. And there we will go through all the revision questions we've gone through over the first six lectures. And again, a reminder that those revision questions, some of them will come up again in the level two exam. So that's a very useful session to attend if you don't attend any other session live. Uh, then, of course, the exam is payable in terms of an exam fee. The course itself is free, so you are welcome to forward the links to your friends and family who've got level one and uh, are interested in writing level two. Um, just a little bit yeah. of admin, uh, <laughs> if you can all, those of That's you it. who it. please Put your microphones on mute. Um, those of you who did not receive the links from me directly, it means that you are not on my mailing list. And for future uh, links and for course material, uh, do yourself a favor, put your email address in the chat box now so that I am able to show you and add you to my mailing list and send you all necessary course material and admin information. OK, so if you got the link for tonight's lesson from somebody else and not from me, please put your email address in the chat box now and I will add you to my mailing list going forward. The exam is 200 rands for uh, anyone in South Africa that is not a member of Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. The bank account is a standard bank account, which I will furnish the details of uh, when I send out the email with the recording of this lecture later tonight. And then, of course, this year we are taking on foreign candidates to write Cricket South Africa's level two exam. And there we are going to be charging uh, 400 South African rands or 27 US dollars. We found that at the level one course, the easiest method of payment was using PayPal. Um, I will send out our PayPal link at the end of tonight's lecture on the email that I sent the recording off. And if you aren't able to pay with PayPal, uh, we can also try wise.com and we can also try um, wire transfers. So I'll give three uh, options for foreign candidates to make payments and hopefully you are able to execute at least one of those. All of you would have somehow gotten through level one so you would have a payment method that worked for level one so we can just replicate that payment 
method for level two. Where there is a big difference between level one and level two is that level two is a written exam. It is out of 100 marks. Again, the pass mark is 80%. And what you need to know is that the exam is a closed book, right? So level one, you are allowed to have your law book next to you. You are allowed to open our presentation while you attempted the exam. Level two, it gets a bit serious in that it's a closed book exam. It's 120 minutes and you need to write it out, not type it out, not copy and paste from the law book. Uh, you need to physically put pen to paper. So for all our Cape Town candidates, we have two options for you to sit in an exam. Uh, it's either Saturday 16th of July, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Newlands Cricket Ground. And we always use the media center because they've got nice uh, work desks that the journalists use um, with uh, seats next to them. And uh, there's a fair bit of spacing that we can have between candidates. Uh, the second uh, option, and both options are open to everyone. So you just need to tell me when you pay your exam fee, which option you will be uh, sitting in on because we need to get the question papers and answer sheets printed out for you to write on. OK, so the second exam sitting option is Monday, the 8th or 18th of July uh, in the evening, half past six until half past eight South African time at the beautiful Newlands Cricket Ground. And for those of you who've never been there, this is an awesome opportunity for you to enjoy the view of the hallowed turf of Newlands. Then for our foreign candidates, uh, we will use Microsoft Teams where you will have your cameras on for the duration of the exam. You will be sitting in a quiet room where there is nobody else and we will need to see that there is no uh, material in terms of a law book or another computer that you can refer to during the writing of the exam. So you'll have your laptop open. I will email the question paper to all of you who are writing in those specific uh, exam slots. So you will either fall in line with the Saturday 16 July or the Monday 18 July uh, time slot. Um, so again, when you make payment for your exam fee, then you need to let me know which of those days you will be uh, writing remotely. And I will only send, I'll only email question papers to those people uh, either on Saturday or on Monday. And once you uh, and you're not allowed to print the uh, question paper. You're only allowed to print the answer sheets. And once you are done writing your exam, then I will need to see you. You will share your screen to me and I'll need to see you deleting the exam from your emails and also from your computer if you have downloaded it onto your computer. OK, it's quite important that we keep uh, the question paper as um, secretive as possible so that it doesn't get out to future candidates, for example, who might want to write the CSA level two exam. Um, the success of this exam with us doing it remotely um, will depend on you and your cooperation and it will also um, open the way for more exams to be made available to uh, foreign candidates um, from Cricket South Africa's point of view. If it's a failure and we find that people have attempted to cheat or have cheated in the exam with the remote um, exam option, then unfortunately that will be the 
last time we do that option. So please, guys, we um, hope that you will cooperate. We want you to cooperate so that uh, this can become a uh, common um, practice for, for us to expand our courses to the rest of the world. Again, payment information will be emailed along with the recording of this lecture. Um, so please don't worry, guys. The payment deadline is only Friday, the 15th of July. Uh, we're still three weeks from there. Uh, we will definitely get to the payments um, throughout the next couple of weeks. So let's move on to the laws that we will be covering today. I made mention of law five and law nine by myself, and then Abdullah will take us through law 11. And after that, we he will take us through a revision, a set of revision questions, and then I will um, facilitate the question and answer session. So. Once again, let's be as interactive as possible. Uh, there's, uh, remember now we're going deeper into details. The, the level two exam is not one word answers, not true or false, not multiple choice. We've got to write sentences. We've got to sometimes even um, regurgitate the law. Uh, we need to know uh, the law in a lot more detail than we needed in law in level one. So let's be let's be uh, interactive and that's how we all learn together. Law five is the bat. The bat consists of two parts, a handle and a blade, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, the top thin part being the handle and the wide thick part being the blade. The handle is to be made principally of cane and or, or wood. The part of the handle that is wholly outside of the blade is defined to be the upper portion of the handle. It is a straight shaft for holding the bat. The upper portion of the handle may be covered with a grip, as is quite common. And we saw that in the pictures earlier. Now, what material shall the blade be made of? The blade comprises the whole of the bat apart from the handle and shall consist solely of wood. OK, so whereas the handle can be made up of cane and wood, the blade shall consist solely of wood. And as with most laws in cricket, this law was introduced as a result of a misdemeanor by uh, a certain Australian. Um, way back in 1979, there's a picture here of umpires talking to Dennis Lilly about his aluminium bat during the first test against England in Perth. Now, I can guarantee you that in 1979, if the law was there that bats would only be made of wood, then Dennis Lilly would not have come out with an aluminium bat. OK, so I can almost guarantee you that this law was put into the law book after this particular incident. So just a reminder that the blade shall consist solely of wood. What you will notice is that in level one, we were highlighting in red the text that will be examined in the level one exam. In level two, there are no highlights of any text in red uh, because, like I said, you need to give long answers, often paragraphs in level two. So uh, all the information that we are presenting in this course you need to know. Think of this presentation as a revision slide pack. OK, so you will need to get accustomed to all four, um, all slides in this particular presentation. Damage to the ball. For any part of the bat 
covered or uncovered, the hardness of the materials and the surface texture thereof shall not be such that either could cause unacceptable damage to the bat. Quite often you find batters like to protect the face of their bat with uh, some sort of tape. Uh, that tape can't be too rough that every time it hits the ball, it potentially would leave a mark um, on the ball. So, so this is what the law is telling us in this particular example. Unacceptable damage is any change that is greater than normal wear and tear caused by the ball striking the caused by the bat striking the ball. When we speak of the bat making contact with the ball, what does the law define this as? Contact between the ball and any of the bat itself, the batsman's hand holding the bat, any part of the glove worn on the batsman's hand holding the bat, and any materials, any additional materials permitted. So if a batter has got a sticker stuck to the uh, edge of the bat and that sticker is not completely stuck down to the edge. If the ball nicks part of that sticker and is then caught, that part, that sticker, because it's connected or attached to the bat, it is considered to be part of the bat. And um, on appeal, it would be very difficult to see or hear it with the naked eye or ear. Um, Snicko might show that um, there's enough evidence there to give the better out court. OK, so that's what the law means when they talk about any additional materials permitted. Contact with the ball shall be regarded as the ball striking or touching the bat or being struck by the bat. In summary. Bat size limits, we will remember from level one that the overall length of the bat when the lower portion of the handle is inserted shall not be more than 96.52 centimeters. OK, so whereas in level one, you would have seen that measurement as a multiple choice option. In level two, you'll probably have to remember that the maximum length of a bat is 96.52 centimeters. You won't be given the multiple choice options. The blade of the bat shall not exceed the following dimensions. Width of 10.8 centimeters, depth of 6.7 centimeters, edges of four centimeters. It should also be able to pass through a bat gauge, which is shown in the picture on screen now. If a bat is able to go through that bat gauge completely, then it is legal. If the bat cannot go through that bat gauge, then it is illegal. It's either too thick or too wide or too deep in terms of the what they call the meat of the bat. OK, uh, this picture was actually taken from a video, I think in 2017 when the law came into being, these new measurements and the bat gauge was introduced. Uh, Sean George was fourth umpire for a test match between South Africa and Bangladesh at Pochestrum's Senves Oval. And the duty of the fourth umpire, one of the duties of the fourth umpire is to check uh, equipment of players, not just the bat, um, but the logos on uh, pads, gloves, helmets, etc. And 
in his routine check, routine and also um, random check of uh, bats. Sean George came across the bat of Quinton de Kock, one of his bats, and it could not fit through the bat gauge. So what then happens is Sean George would have informed the owner of the bat that this bat is too thick and it cannot be used in the match. Uh, they will not confiscate it. Uh, however, if Quinton de Kock had gone out to bat with that particular bat, he definitely would have been fined by the International Cricket Council um, after having been reported by the umpires and the match referee. So that's the procedure as to how we manage um, the size limits of bats at international level as well as domestic level. Uh, when you get down to club cricket level, we still find that Maybe a batter bought a bat back in 2016 when there they weren't as many restrictions on the size of bats. And uh, we're not going to um, tell the guy not to use that bat. In fact, uh, most of our club cricket umpires do not possess a bat gauge. Uh, however, if it, a bat does look suspiciously big, uh, then you can contact um, one of your senior umpires who might have a bat gauge. And I think we would need to, if this particular batter is scoring a lot of runs with that illegally big bat, we would need to tell him that maybe this is the last match that you're allowed to play with that bat. Um, but I must say, um, five years having a bat gauge, I've never had a bat that doesn't go through the bat gauge. So, yeah, you, it really needs to be an oversized bat to not be allowed to be used. So now we move on to Law 9. As I said, we're only going through the laws that are examined in the Level 2 Cricket South Africa umpiring exam. So that is why we haven't gone through law one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, and we're jumping straight to law nine, which is preparation and maintenance of the playing area. There's a fair bit of preparation that goes into especially the pitch. Let's see what the law says about mowing of the pitch as well as mowing of the outfield. Both the pitch and the outfield shall be mown on each day of the match on which play is expected to take place if ground and weather conditions permit. So the reason that the ground staff do this is to try and make conditions as similar as possible from day one, two, three, four, and five of a test match, for example. And you will find that when it comes to mowing of the pitch, as well as mowing of the outfield, the mowers are set to the same level every day. And you will be amazed at how much uh, grass grows overnight because you would think if you cut an outfield or if you mow a pitch on day one, the next day the grass shouldn't have grown significantly enough for you to need to cut it. Uh, but that is not the case, especially if there has been rain around and the pitch has been sweating under the covers, that sweat will lead to um, accelerated growth of the grass overnight. So very important as a reserve umpire in a first class match. If it's not televised, then it will be at the third umpire. If it is televised, then it, that would be the duty of the fourth umpire to inspect 
and oversee the mowing of especially the pitch. Uh, quite often the mowing of the outfield is done well before the umpires arrive at the ground. Um, so that one we don't necessarily inspect, but the mowing of the pitch we definitely inspect. And in fact, there is a bar that is used to set the level that the grass is cut at, the level that the mower is high or low, depending on how much grass you want to leave on the pitch. And the reserve umpire usually keeps that bar uh, to ensure that it is not, the level is not changed throughout the match. It stays the same because you need that bar to change the level of the mower. If complete mowing of the outfield is not possible, the ground authority shall notify the captains and umpires of the procedures to be adopted for such mowing during the match. Uh, this usually happens if the outfield is too wet, it will damage the lawn mower. So therefore the ground staff knowing the extent to which the mower can take water will either allow or disallow the mowing of the outfield if the outfield is wet. Quite important is the timing of the mowing. When do we mow the pitch and when do we mow the outfield? Let's see what the law says. Mowing of the pitch on any day shall be completed not later than 30 minutes before the time scheduled or rescheduled for play to begin on that day before any sweeping or rolling. OK, so what that means is if a test match starts at 10 a.m., then mowing of the pitch shall be completed before 9.30, okay? Pretty straightforward. Mowing of the outfield on any day shall be completed not later than 15 minutes before the time scheduled or rescheduled for play to begin on that day. So again, if we go back to our 10 a.m. start for a test match at Pochestrum between South Africa and Bangladesh, then the outfield needs to be mowed by no later than 9.45. Um, practically, it is done a lot earlier than that. Why? Because you will know that both teams tend to do their warm-ups on the outfield. So you cannot still be mowing the outfield between, through and around players while they are trying to warm up. Uh, so that's why I mentioned earlier that typically the mowing of the outfield is done so early that sometimes the umpires are not even around to see it happen. Clearing debris from the pitch. The pitch shall be cleared of any debris before the start of each day's play, after the completion of mowing, and before any rolling. Not earlier than 30 minutes, nor later than 10 minutes before the time or rescheduled start of play. If you guys remember from level one, rolling of the pitch follows the same window period in terms of time. You can roll the pitch if you've got a 10 a.m. start between 9.30 and 9.50. Okay, so typically the order of events in terms of preparing the pitch is mowing the pitch, which needs to be completed by 9.30 then clearing of the debris will take one, maybe two minutes max. Uh, so that's really just sweeping. 
and you typically only you don't sweep the protected area you only sweep from um, in 1.52 meters in front of the pop increase which is the start of the protected area you can sweep from there backwards towards the creases okay so really if you're going to be sweeping um, the non-protected areas of the pitch then you are going to be taking a minute on either end maximum. Okay, so you mow from 9.25, you finish at 9.30 as per the law, and then you sweep for one or two minutes, and then you roll for up to seven minutes. Okay, that is the sequence of which to follow for the preparation of the pitch. Between innings before rolling, if any is to take place, um, that is when you can sweep as well. At all intervals for meals, you can also sweep. And the clearance of debris shall be done by sweeping, except where the umpires consider that this may be detrimental to the surface of the pitch. In this case, the debris must be cleared from that area by hand and without sweeping. Okay, you find it quite often in the subcontinent in the later days of a test match, day three, day four, day five, where the pitch is crumbling into a dust bowl and sweeping might just widen the cracks even more so then um, all you'll have is you'll have a ground staff personnel uh, using their hand to sweep with the hand not a brush uh, the debris away from uh, what i would say the action area in terms of where the batter would stand and just make sure that it is um, off the pitch completely. If uh, he or she can pick it up with the hand, then that's best just to dispose of it. Um, what the law does not mention here is uh, during a drinks break, if you are struggling to see the pop increase, because the bowler is quite tight on the front line, you quite often have umpires requesting for the pop increase or the entire crease to be repainted so that they can see a little bit better. Whenever they repaint the lines, they typically also sweep before repainting. So that can be done uh, during a drinks break even though the law doesn't mention it, it is common practice. Rolling of the pitch, we discussed it in detail in level one, and it comes up again in level two, because it is a, an important part of the game. So how often and how long do we roll for? Let's see what the law says. During the match, the pitch may be rolled at the request of the captain of the batting side for a period no more than seven minutes before the start of each innings, other than the first innings of the match and before the start of each subsequent day's play. Uh, so the important part there is that it's only the batting captain or the captain who is going to bat after this particular interval that can request the rolling of the pitch and the other important aspect is the maximum time of seven minutes so if he or she asks you to roll for one minute that's fine roll for two three or four minutes that's fine five six or the maximum seven minutes is also fine uh, what is not fine is for him or her to request two minutes with the light roller and five minutes with the heavy roller. Even though that's still within the seven minutes that is allowable, uh, that's just impractical. 
Um, I've never heard any captain ask of a mixture of rollers. Um, I can tell you now that a groundsman will tell the captain uh, it's not going to happen. How long or what is the timing and when can we roll? The rolling permitted before a day's play begins on any day shall be started not more than 30 minutes and no less than 10 minutes before the time scheduled or rescheduled for play to begin. Okay, so we go back to our 10 a.m. test match start. The window period for starting rolling is between 9.30 and 9.50. Um, so, Abdullah, you can correct me if I'm wrong later on when you start with your law 11. You can start rolling as late as 9.50. Um, this has been a debate over the years. I'm quite sure that you can start as late as 9.50, but other umpires say you have to be finished by 9.50. So let's just maybe get some clarity on that particular timing. Watering of the pitch. Are we allowed to water a match pitch during a four day game or a test match? Let's see what the law says. Pretty simple. The pitch shall not be watered during any part of the match. What you do find at domestic level is we used to play a three day game from Wednesday, sorry, from Thursday to Saturday, and then we play a one day game on Sunday. And quite often they would use two different strips to play those two different matches. But because the days leading up to the one day match being played on a different strip, there is limited preparation that can be done on the one day strip um, during playing time of the three day game. So quite often uh, grounds staff would request um, the umpires or the match referee, if there was one, if they could water the pitch that is going to be used on Sunday, on Thursday night or Friday night. Um, I've never heard of the night before Saturday night. Uh, and yes, that is allowable as long as it is not immediately adjacent to the current playing strip of the three day match. Um, so there needs to be another one or two practice pitches in between the playing strip and the Sunday strip that the groundsman wants to water on Thursday night or Friday night. Okay, but quite clear one line, the match pitch on a three day game, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you cannot water that particular strip. Remarking of creases, creases shall be remarked whenever the either umpire shall consider it necessarily, usually during intervals. And as I mentioned, it usually happens after sweeping. What else do we need to do to make sure the match runs smoothly? We need to maintain the footholds where the bowlers land in their bowling action. In matches of more than one day's duration, the umpires shall allow, if necessary, the returfing of footholds made by the bowlers in their delivery strides or the use of quick setting fillings for that purpose. Okay, so this often happens overnight after a day's play. If the hole has become such that it would be dangerous for a new bowler to land uh, with the risk of rolling over his or her ankle, then the ground staff shall remake 
the footholds. What about during the match? Umpires shall allow the players to secure their footholds by the use of sawdust, provided that no damage to the pitch is caused and that law 41 is not contravened. Uh, one of the laws that could be contravened there is time wasting. And so we just need to be careful that players are not putting on a show just because their team is losing and there is rain that is forecast to come later in the day's play. And if they can just delay the batting side from getting to their target in the next few overs, then they would be able to get away with a draw in more day cricket. So we just need to be cognizant of the fact that sometimes players just use um, footholds as an excuse to waste time. But safety first, and that is our main concern when it comes to the game of cricket, us as umpires, safety for players, umpires and ground staff alike. So that is me done with law five and nine. I'm now going to unshare and Abdullah is going to share and take us through law 11, as well as questions and answers relating to laws five, nine and 11. Over to you, Abdullah. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Good evening to you and good evening to the rest of the uh, participants. I will be covering Law 11 tonight, then I will do three revision questions and the revision questions we will uh, keep interactive. So I will be ask, asking uh, the question and I will go to the floor um, to get the answers. And then after the re three the revision questions, we will then open the floor for Q&A. So Law 11, intervals. So what is an interval? So the following will be classified as scheduled intervals. Now, scheduled intervals are intervals that are determined before the game starts. So they are set by the governing body uh, of cricket um, to have in that particular game. So let's see examples of scheduled intervals. The period between close of play on one day and the start of play the next day. So let's use an example of a five-day test match. The um, on day one, the, let's say the playing hours are from ten till five. So at the end of the day, at five o'clock, the umpires will call time. That's on day one. Day two will start the following day at ten o'clock. So the period between five o'clock on day one and ten o'clock on day two is classified as a scheduled interval. Interval between innings, that is also a scheduled interval. Interval for meals, uh, tea time or lunch time, another example of a scheduled interval. Intervals for drinks is also a scheduled interval. And lastly, any other agreed interval it's also seen as a scheduled interval. So how long should these intervals be? So now according to law, they don't give you a specific time. These times or the duration of the intervals are set by the governing bodies of cricket for that particular competition. If I can use uh, test matches as an example, the uh, ICC, the International Cricket Council, they set their lunch interval to be 40 minutes and the tea interval to be 20 minutes. Uh, most competition around the world that I do know of um, stick to these timings. Yes, there are certain uh, countries and comp um, competitions that do alter these times, but I would say 99% um, of the countries in modern cricket have 
lunch at 40 minutes and tea at 20 minutes. So those times were set by the governing body of cricket. So all the law tells us is that that interval that ever was agreed upon by the governing body, and let's use lunch as an example. So the government, so the ICC decided lunch to be 40 minutes. So that duration shall be from the call of time before the interval until the call of play on the resumption after the interval. An example of this, let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock and at 12 o'clock the last ball gets bowled and the umpire calls uh, over time and lunch. When will play resume after lunch? At 12.40. It's not always the case that you will end exactly at 12 o'clock. Sometimes you uh, you go over 12 because you do need to uh, complete the over. There are times uh, where you can fin go over 12. You, sometimes you can um, end a little bit earlier than 12 o'clock. If you do go over 12, uh, let's say uh, you complete the over and you finish the over at 12.03. What the law tells us, that the interval needs to be the agreed duration. So 40 minutes as per the governing body. So if we, if time was called at 12.03, play will resume at 12.43. You will have a 40 minute interval. According to law, the interval between innings shall be 10 minutes. So the moment a, a side gets bowled out or declares, that interval between the innings shall be 10 minutes and it will start uh, as soon as the declaration comes or the, the final wicket gets taken until the call of play for the start of the next innings. So there are times where we will not allow an 10 minute interval between innings. One such instance is, let's say the uh, close of play is five o'clock. So if an innings ends when there are 10 minutes or less before the agreed close of play, no further play will take place on that particular day. An example, our close of play is five o'clock. At 16.50, side A gets bowled out. So that is 10 minutes or less before the agreed close of time, according to law, because it's 10 minutes or less, that will be close of play for that particular day. Yes, we did in uh, 10 minutes um, earlier, but according to law, if an innings in 10 minutes or less, we shall, uh, it shall be close of play. A and the next day, play will not start 10 minutes earlier. Secondly, we will also not take an, a 10 minute interval between uh, innings if uh, there is uh, a captain declares an innings during a scheduled interval of 10 minutes or more, or there's been an interruption of 10 minutes or more. If that happens, we will not take a 10 minute uh, change of innings interval, that 10 minutes change of innings interval shall be incorporated into the, the lunch break or tea break or the interruption. An example of, of this is, let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock and, and um, so we know it's a 40 minute lunch, so lunch will be completed by 12.40. At 20 past, uh, 20 past 12, the captain of Team A comes to you and he informs you that that he or she is declaring. So now what the law tells us is, yes, there will now be a change of innings, but because this declaration happened in a scheduled interval of more than 10 minutes and there are more than 10 minutes left of the, of the lunch interval, so this change of innings interval will now be incorporated into the lunch interval. Same applies for tea, okay, but 
if the batting captain comes to you and inform you that he or she is declaring at 12 35 for, for example so 12 35 EOC comes to you and say umpire uh, we are declaring according to law now in that instance lunch supposed to end at 12 uh, 40 the captain came to you at 12 35 we need to give the opposing captain 10 minutes to get ready two reasons for that the opening batters now needs to to pair up and then secondly, the now batting captain gets the option for rolling. So you now need to, uh, to give time for rolling as well. And that's why you need to give 10 minutes uh, time for this change of innings uh, interval. So if, he, if, he, um, if the captain declared at 12.35, play will resume at 12.45. So before, for many years, uh, your lunch times and your tea times were fixed. You could not change them. If they were 12 o'clock and let's say tea time was at 3 o'clock, those were fixed. You could not change those times, no matter what happened. Over time, the lawmakers uh, realized we need to be a bit more flexible. And yes, they then... Uh, adjusted the laws to be a bit more flexible with regards to the timings of the intervals. So yes, your times for your intervals get set before the games, uh, before the game start by the governing uh, body, but the lawmakers allows for a bit of flexibility and they allow the those timings of the intervals to be changed. So let's see what the law allows and not allow. The law firstly tells us that if because of ground, weather or light, typical example is uh, weather, uh, rain, maybe bad, uh, bad light. So if because of these uh, conditions, players needs to leave the field, the lunch or tea interval may be changed by the two umpires and both captains. So the important thing here is, yes, the law allows the lunch and tea times to be changed, but the two umpires and both captains needs to agree to this. If there's no agreement, uh, usually the, the umpires will agree. We've got no issue uh, from an umpiring point of view, changing the, the timings of the interval, but there are times where the captains may be not agree. But the law is quite clear. Both captains need to agree for the lunch or tea interval to be uh, changed. So that is firstly where the law just gives a, 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 a blanket uh, statement by saying, if because of adverse, adverse weather conditions, yes, you can change your lunch and tea intervals. Okay, but umpires need to agree and both captains need to agree. There are other instances where the law tells us that the intervals can be changed. And in these uh, circumstances, you do not need the consent of both captains. What are those instances? The law tells us if an innings ends 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, that interval will then be taken immediately. You do not need the captain's uh, consent. You will take the interval immediately according to the law. And, and further on, it tells us that now you've taken the interval a bit earlier, uh, but your interval will be the agreed duration as per the governing body. So let's use 40 minutes in our example, and I'll use an example to illustrate this point. Let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock. At 11.52, side A gets bowled out. So now there's a, the innings ended at 11.52. Uh, so it's now eight minutes before the scheduled lunch interval at 12 o'clock. So law tells us here in point one, 
If an innings end 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, which is 12 o'clock in our case, lunch shall be taken immediately. So lunch will be now be taken at 11.52. What time will we resume after lunch? Yes, correct. Lunch is 40 minutes. So we will restart at 12.32. We will have our 40 minutes uh, lunch. Secondly, if there is an interruption or there's adverse conditions because of ground weather or light, and that happens 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, law tells us you don't need to uh, the captain's agreement, you will take lunch immediately. And lunch shall then also be the agreed duration, uh, weather permitting or if conditions permit you to restart. An example of this, let's say lunch is at 12 o'clock, it starts raining at 11.56 and players need to, to leave the field. So it's 11.56, so now the law kicks in, the law tells us if there's a stoppage, 10 minutes or less, and 11.56 is 10 minutes or less before the agreed time for lunch, you will take lunch immediately. So lunch will be taken from 11.56 the duration will be 40 minutes. You will then restart after lunch, weather permitting, at 12.36. So now we've just covered what to do, um, to do uh, with lunch time. We will now cover tea time and when you can change your timing for tea. Firstly, if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea. Now, tea time is the same principle you will apply um, as to the lunch time when an innings ends. The only difference here is lunch time is, is if an innings ends 10 minutes or less. Tea time if the innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea, you will then take the the t interval immediately an example of this let's say t time is at three o'clock at 14 40 team a gets bowled out what do you do according to law it tells us that if an innings ends 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for t and in in, the, in this example it is 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for t you will take T immediately. T shall then be whatever the agreed duration uh, that was decided by the mother uh, body. And in um, our example, the ICC um, has got T time at 20 minutes. So, so if the T time started at 14:40, when will we? When will play resume? Yes, at three o'clock. Point two, so when 30 minutes remains before the agreed time for tea, and there's already an interval between innings in progress, the law now tells us that play shall resume at the end of this 10-minute change of innings interval. Example of this, tea time is at 3 o'clock. South Africa gets bowled out at 14 25. So the innings ends at 14.25. So the if we look at point number one, if an innings ends 30 minutes or less, in my example now, is this 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for T? No, it's not. It is 35 minutes. So can you take T according to point number one? No, you cannot take T. So what point number two is telling us is, so if an innings ends 14 at 14.25, you will then take a 10-minute uh, change of innings interval and play shall resume 10 minutes later at 14.35 and play will then continue from 14.35 up until our scheduled uh, T interval at 3 o'clock.
Point number three, same principle apply as to uh, the, the lunch interval, and you'll see now what I mean. If because of adverse weather conditions, and let's uh, use rain as an example, if it rains 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea, tea shall be taken immediately. So if tea is at three o'clock and it starts raining at 14.30, according to the law, this is 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea at three, the tea interval shall then be taken immediately. Lee. T shall then be of the 20 minute uh, duration. So T will be from 14.30 until 14.50 weather conditions permitting. So it's exactly the same principle as lunchtime. The only difference is with lunchtime, if an innings, if, uh, if it rains 10 minutes before the agreed time for lunch, you'll take uh, early lunch, tea time, Slightly more, it's in tea time's uh, case, it is 30 minutes or less before the agreed time for tea. Point number four tells us, so if there is a stoppage already in progress, when 30 minutes remains before the, the agreed tea time of three o'clock, you will bring tea forward by 30 minutes. So an example of this, tea time is three o'clock at 14.10, it starts raining. So can you take an early tea? No, you cannot. If you look at point number three, the reason you cannot take an early tea at 10 past two is, the law tells us, if a stoppage occur 30 minutes or less, then you can take an early tea. This, uh, this rain interruption happened at 14.10, which is 50 minutes before, la before the, uh, the scheduled T interval. So point number four is telling us, so if it rains at 14.10, you need to wait till 14.30. And when you get to 14.30, you then can take an early T and the T interval shall be the 20 minutes from 14.30 till 14.50 um, weather conditions permitting. We're still on the theme of saving a bit of time. Again, uh, uh, the, um, many years ago, the the lawmakers were, tea's at three o'clock, we'll take it at three. If lunch is at, two o at 12 o'clock, we'll take it, no matter what happens. But over time, lawmakers realized that um, we're trying to maximize play throughout the day. And one of the the methods um, they found out how to maximize play is if a side is nine wickets down at the lunch or tea interval. Uh, they've noticed over the years the the uh, the tenth wicket doesn't usually um, uh, last that long. The fielding side usually take the tenth wicket quickly. So now, in order to maximize time, the lawmakers decided that. So if a side is nine wickets down, when three minutes remains to the time for the lunch or the tea interval. So if that is the case, what you will then do is you will not take lunch or tea at the scheduled, uh, inter at the scheduled time. You will delay it by 30 minutes unless you get, you need to leave the field, let's say it's rain, it rains, or you take the 10th wicket. So an example of this, and I'll, I'll use two examples. I'll start with lunchtime. Let's say lunchtime is at 12 o'clock, and at 12.57, uh, 11.57, side A is, is 200, for nine, you start with the with the over at twelve o'clock. The final ball gets bowled. So at exactly twelve, side A is two hundred for nine wickets. So what do we do? Do we take lunch now at twelve o'clock? No. The law tells us 
you need to delay that lunge interval because the side is nine wickets down, you delay it by half an hour maximum. If the fielding side cannot take the 10th wicket within that half an hour, so from 12 till 12.30, you give them up till 12.30. If they cannot take the, ninth, uh, the 10th wicket in that half an hour, you will then take lunch at 12.30. And how long will lunch be? Correct. Lunch will be 40 minutes. And lunch will be from 12.30 till 13.10. That's lunch. Second example, I'm going to use tea time, but the same principle, same principle apply whether it's lunch or tea. So tea is at three o'clock. At 14.58, uh, side A is 300 for the last of eight wickets. Tea time is at three o'clock. The third ball of the over, the bowler bowls the number 10 better. So now with one minute to go, at four, that we could fail at 1459. Now side A is nine wickets down with one minute to go until tea time. What do you do? So according to law, if the nine wicket falls within the three minutes or at any time up to and including the final ball, T will not be taken. You will delay it for 30 minutes. Let's say the, the final wicket gets taken at 15.10. The 10th wicket gets taken at 15.10. What do you then do? You will take T, and T will be 20 minutes from 15.10 till 15.30. Interval for drinks. Again, the, this is a scheduled interval. Drinks is a scheduled interval. The governing body of cricket, uh, um, of that particular competition, decides the duration of the drink, drinks interval uh, at at international level, in test matches, the drinks interval is four minutes. Law doesn't tell us exactly how long your drinks interval should be. All it tells us is it should not exceed five minutes. Also, if, so usually when we, the uh, drinks interval is in the middle of the session in test match cricket, well, they play two-hour sessions. Start, let's say the test match starts at 10 o'clock. Lunch will be at 12 o'clock. Drinks will be in the middle at 11 o'clock. So point number two is telling us is that if you get to 11 o'clock and you're still in the middle of the over, you'll complete that over and then you'll take the drinks interval. Okay, but... If a wicket falls or a batter retires within five minutes of the agreed time for the drinks interval, you will take the drinks interval immediately. Again, this is to maximize time. So an example of this, drinks is at 11 o'clock. At 11.57, a wicket falls. Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, drinks is at 11 o'clock at 10.57 a week it falls. So according to law, this is now within five minutes of drinks. You will then take drinks immediately. Again, this is done to maximize play during uh, the day. However, the week it falls at 11, uh, at 10.54, what do you do? According to law, the next batter needs to come in and you will take the rings at 11 o'clock. And the reason is, this is not within five minutes of the scheduled drinks break at 11 o'clock. Interval for drinks may not be taken during the last hour of the match. And lastly, 
whenever the umpires, captains, or when, whenever there is a change in the tea or lunch interval or any timings during the course of the day, please make sure that you inform the scorers. It's important if you do take an early lunch, uh, when you do leave the field, just go to the scorers and inform them. Scorers, we're taking an early lunch and you give the reason and you tell the scorers what time play will resume. Uh, Tom, that is that is uh, my law for this evening. I'm now going to go through three revision questions. I want this to be interactive, so I want the um, volunteers um, to put up their hands and to answer these questions. These are revision questions um, were pertaining to the three laws that we covered this evening. So, first question, name four breaks in play that are classified as scheduled intervals. We've discovered it. Um, uh, Tom, are there any hands? Uh, if there mm. are, uh, they can unmute themselves and give me one. So, can, can uh, whoever's hands was raised first, can they just give one and then the second one can give another one? Please, Tom. Kurt has raised his hand first. Kurt, you can unmute your microphone and give us one example of a scheduled interval, please. Uh, thank you, Tom and Abdullah. Um, the one that I want to give is the um, end of play on day one and the start of play on day two that is classified as an interval. Uh, well done, Kurt. Yeah, that is uh, one example. Um, next hand, Tom. Nazmi, you are next with your hand up. Please unmute your microphone and give us a second example of a scheduled interval. Hi, good evening, all. Thank you, Tom and Abdullah. Just the one I would like to give is between the innings. There's a, a, it's also um, called a scheduled um, interval. Oh, well done, Nazmi. Yes, interval between innings. That is a central interval. Uh, next, Tom. Jitendra has got his hand up. Jitendra, you can unmute your microphone and give us another example of a scheduled interval. Yeah, good evening, all. Uh, yeah, and the, uh, the third one which I would like to tell is the interval for meals. It can be for lunch or for tea, both together. It is interval for meals. Well done, Sitendra. Spot on. Intervals for meals. Uh, meals are tea time and lunch time, and those are scheduled intervals. Next hand up is Amarjit to give us another interval, scheduled intervals. Yes, good evening, everybody. The next uh, interval evening, is inter yes, interval for drinks. Well done, Namarjit. You are correct. Interval for drinks is an example of a scheduled interval. And lastly, Tom, there's yeah, one more. Abdullah, there is one more. Um, and we've got Brent Pitt with his hand up. Brent, if you can unmute your microphone and give us the last one, which is probably the toughest one. It's the bonus point for Tom. Uh, hi, Tom. Hi, Tom, can you hear me? Loud and clear, go ahead. Uh, Dalla, can you hear me? Uh, uh, copy that, print, uh, so loud and clear. Any other great <laughs> interval would be considered uh, a break of play. Well done, uh, Brent. Correct. This is the bonus uh, mark. Uh, we only need to give four, but bonus mark any other great interval. Uh, well done, everyone. Next question. Upon arriving at the field, you and your colleague notice that the curator is still rolling the pitch. So if I can sketch uh, the scenario. So this, e um, this is, a, let's say, a, a test match or uh, a test match. And um, day one, 
on the morning of day one, you get to the field. The game starts at 10 o'clock. You get to the field at half past eight. And as you arrive, you and your colleague arrived at the field, you see that the curator is rolling the pits. What will you do? Uh, Paul Franzman had his uh, hand up, but uh, I think he saw it was a bit of a tricky question, so he put his hand down. Uh, Arabinda, you've still got your hand up. Uh, would you like to unmute your microphone and give this question a go for us? Arabinda, are you still with us? Please unmute your microphone. Am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. Uh, I think uh, it should be allowed. That's correct, Arabinda. Why would you say it's allowed? Uh, Are there no restrictions rolling? for rolling? Excuse me? Are there no restrictions in terms of when you can roll the pits? Uh, I think uh, not uh, more than 30 minutes before uh, it should be allowed uh, for rolling. Is there a difference on day one and day two, for example, as to when you can roll and when you cannot roll before the start of play? Uh, not on day one. Uh, other day, uh, it should be allowed. OK, Abdullah, do you want to give us the formal yeah. answer there? Yeah, I'll give uh, I'll give it to um, to everyone. So no action shall be taken. And the reason is, remember, this is day one. Play is going to start at 10 o'clock. The toss is going to take place half an hour before the schedule start. So toss at 9.30. So before the game and up until the toss, the, the curator he is responsible for the preparation of uh, that pitch. And once you get to the toss, then only it becomes the responsibility of the umpire. So from the toss onwards, the responsibility of the umpires, and before then, responsibility of the ground authority. So he was all in his right to roll the pitch and prepare it for the game. Last of the revision questions for the evening, but it's, uh, uh, there are three parts to it. So after the ground was handed over to the umpires at half past nine on day one, now the maintenance of the playing area becomes the responsibility of the umpires. So 3.1. What is the maximum time allowed for rolling? Kurt, you can go ahead. Um, you've put your hand up again. OK, I see a whole lot of people that have put their hands up. Kurt, can we give others a chance? Because you've already answered a previous question. So the yeah, next hand up yes, was. Right. Thank you, Kurt. The next hand up was Simon. Simon, please unmute your microphone. Good evening, everyone. Um, the maximum time allowed for rolling is seven minutes, not more than seven minutes. Uh, well, well done. Perfect answer. Maximum time is seven minutes of rolling. Uh, yes, the batting captain is allowed less than seven minutes. So if the batting captain wants five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, one minute, half a minute of rolling, that's his prerogative, no problem. But the maximum time for rolling is seven minutes. Yeah. 3.2. With regards to the timings, when is the earliest that the pitch can be rolled and also the latest that the pitch 
can be rolled on any subsequent day during a match. We're now referring to, let's say this is a three-day test, a five-day test match. We're now referring to day two, day three, day four, and day five. So what, what are the timings? What is the earliest and what are the latest? Arabinda, I see your hand up, but let's give others a chance who haven't yet answered a question. Srini Keth, if you can unmute your microphone and let us know what is the earliest and what is the latest time you can roll before the start of a subsequent day's play. Yeah, hello, hello, good. Hello, everyone. The earliest time is the 9.30 and the latest time is uh, the 9.50. That is uh, well done. Yes, there is a window period. Uh, so the law tells us that if the game starts at 10 o'clock, the earliest that rolling can be done on day 2, 3 or 4 or 5 is 9.30. And a captain can delay that rolling up until not later than 10 minutes before the schedule time, and in our case, 10 o'clock. And Tom, to answer your, your question that you posed um, earlier, the, um, yes, not ideal, especially if a captain takes, uh, takes the full seven minutes um, of rolling. Uh, but according to law, you are allowed to delay the rolling for up until 9.50. So that rolling will take place from 9.50 till 9.57 with the game starting at uh, 10 o'clock. In all my years, I never had a captain delay it uh, so late, but according to law, uh, he can, the captain can delay it up until uh, 9.50 for the latest. Perfect. Thanks, Dula, for clearing that up. Uh, just a word of advice to Shrini Keth. The question was for three marks and um, you gave 9.30 and 9.50. You can see in level two that we need to flesh out our sentences a little bit more. And to get the third mark, I think the important uh, words that you were missing is the scheduled or rescheduled start of play okay because um obviously if it's raining at 9 30 we won't toss the covers sorry we won't um have a roll because the covers will still be on uh, so that's why it's quite important to mention that rolling can take place no earlier than 30 minutes nor later than 10 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled start of play on any subsequent day. Okay, this is the level that is required for us to get the 80% that we're looking for in terms of a pass mark on level two. Next question, Dula. The last of the revision questions for the evening, Tom, before we open the, the floor for Q&A. So at what time should mowing of the pitch on any day be completed? Mowing of the pitch and the game starts at 10 o'clock. Suleyma, you have jumped to the top of the queue. Uh, please unmute your microphone and you can answer the question for us. Uh, good evening, Tom, uh, Abdullah and everyone. Um, the answer is um, you would not be able to mow later than 9.30. So 30 minutes before the start of play. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well done. This is a two mark question. And uh, what they're expecting you to say is, yes, the mowing of the pitch on any day shall, shall be completed not later than 30 minutes before the scheduled or rescheduled time for play to begin on that day and before any sweeping prior to rolling. So the game starts at now at 10 o'clock by 9.30, mowing of the pitch needs to be completed. Thank you so much, Tom.
Tom, that is the revision questions for this evening. Uh, we can now open the floor for Q&A. Thanks, Dula. I'm moving on to the questions in the chat box. And I'm just scrolling through to make sure I don't miss any. Uh, Ashish asks, up to what hand is considered in case of the hand holding the bat uh, being part of the bat when a shot is played or the ball makes contact with the glove. You want to take that one, Abdullah? Sorry, I didn't hear the question, Tom. What, I just heard a hand. You were breaking up from my side, yeah? Okay. Up to what hand is considered in case of the hand holding the bat? So is it only the bottom hand or is it also the top hand? Is it uh, a hand that's not holding the bat? Does that count as part of the bat? Uh, thank you so much for your question, um, uh, Asis. So what you need to look out for is the, it can be both hands. The, the important thing is those hands must be on the bat and if the ball then makes contact with uh, either of the hands holding the bat and it pops up to first slip you can then and it gets uh, taken cleanly you, you should then be given out uh, court so just to emphasize again if both hands are on the bat and the ball strikes it you, you are you leave yourself open to be caught if one of the hands is not on the bat or not holding the bat, let's use uh, firstly uh, the top hand. For whatever reason, you remove the top hand from the bat. And the moment the, the ball makes contact with the top hand, that hand is then not holding the bat. And then the ball then loops from the top hand, the glove to first slip you uh, should not be given out because the hand, the top hand was not holding the bat. Same principle applies to the bottom hand. If you do take your bottom hand off the bat and the ball then makes contact with, the, with your bottom hand while it's off the bat or not holding the bat and it loops to slip or the keeper or any other fielder, uh, you uh, will not be given out because the bottom man was not holding the bat. So just to summarize, for you to be given out caught off the glove, it needs to strike either of the hands, but those hands must be holding the bat. Did I answer the question, Tom? 100% Dula. Thank you very much yeah. for that thorough answer. Next okay, question thanks. is from Juguna. Uh, if a ball strikes the arm guard on the hand holding the bat and the ball is caught before touching the ground, what would your decision be in regards to the hand holding the bat? So let's imagine that arm guard is extended on top of the glove. And I'm busy looking for a picture of Liam Livingston who covered his wrist with a arm guard because it was broken. Um, so what happens in that case when the arm guard is in contact with the glove, but the ball makes contact with the arm guard, loops up in the air and is caught on the full? Is that better out or not out? Thank you, Nizakuna, for, for your question. Firstly, let me give the decision. The decision is not out. And the reason is the law tells us the ball needs to make contact with any part of the bat or the hand or the glove holding the bat. And the glove, uh, the, what constitutes the glove is the full glove, including the, the wristband that is also part of the glove. So if the ball makes contact with the bat, or, or full glove, including the wrist, uh, the the wristband that is that is part of the glove, and it uh, pops up and it gets taken cleanly by any of the fielders. You shall be given out uh, court. Arm guard is 
uh, not part of uh, the glove. Yes, uh, in Tom's example, it does go over the a uh, little bit over the um, um, the glove, uh, but arm guard is not part of the. And taken cleanly by any of the fielders, the decision shall be not out. It's only the glove, including the wristband, as well as the bat for the batter to be given out court. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks, Dula. I've put a picture in the chat box of uh, Liam Livingston, who was protecting his wrist by covering it with a arm guard completely. And the question here is if the ball had come off the arm guard, especially the bottom part of the arm guard where his glove is behind, would that be out court? Abdullah has explained to us, no, even though the arm guard is touching the glove, the arm guard is not part of the bat or part of the glove holding the bat. So the decision will be not out. Thanks, Dula. I thought it would just be useful to show mm -hmm. a picture of an example. Next question, and I've lost my place on the chat box now since I went and put that picture on. Um, Swapnil, thank you for answering some of these questions in the chat box, but we will still go through all of them. And another question from Juguna. Before the start of play on any on day two, is it the captain to request for a seven-minute roller, or does the ground staff prepare the pitch on their own decision? Thank you for your question, Zakuna. It is up to the batting captain to the request rolling or not. So uh, practically, what will happen? Uh, let's say this is a test match, so there were there, there are usually four umpires um, at a test match. So the fourth umpire, before play starts um, on day two, will go to the captain of the batting side. We'll, we'll ask the captain of the batting side at the time, do you want rolling or not? Uh, and which roller and how long you want rolling for? If the captain tells... Uh, um, the fourth umpire, yes, I want rolling, big roller, seven minutes. The fourth umpire will then relay that question, that answer to the the ground staff. So the, the ground staff usually at this match um, venues, uh, they, uh, they are clued up. They know that they need to wait for the, for the, uh, for the fourth umpire to inform them what roller and how long they need to be rolling. They actually also need to wait for the fourth umpire before they cut the or so before they mow the pits. So practically, the groundsman before the start of play won't do anything until the fourth umpire arrives because um, the uh, mowing of the pits, um, rolling of the pits needs to be done under the supervision of the fourth umpire. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Next question is from Swapno. Very good question. Uh, during the match, the interval between innings happens at any time. We cannot predict when a side will be bowled out. Why does the law constitute the innings, the interval between innings as a scheduled interval? I've never heard that one before, so I'll give it over to you, Dula. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Tom. Mm. Uh, the so the it gets classified as a a scheduled interval because it's a fixed time. Nine out of ten times the interval will be ten minutes, unless it happens at the end of the day or uh, with uh, in a lunch or tea interval or in a rain interruption of more than uh, ten minutes. So they fix they fix this uh, interval. To give the the um, the batting side now enough for the opening bat uh, time to pair up for the for the batting captain if uh, he or she wants rolling for that seven minutes if they want it um, 
to take place. So to answer your, your question, uh, it gets to us set before the game so that the, everyone knows and moment aside gets, uh, gets dismissed. There is a 10 minute break and in that 10 minute break, it allows um, the batting side now to pair up and the grounds authority to do their duties if a rolling and a sweeping and needs to, to take place. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Tom. No, I thought the same as well, Abdullah. The fact that there is a scheduled amount of time for that particular interval uh, makes it a scheduled interval. Um, even lunch and tea can move in terms of when um, we take them. So I don't think a set time uh, constitutes a scheduled interval. I think a set duration constitutes a scheduled interval. That's my thoughts. Uh, next question. In agreed drinks interval, is it necessary to call time before drinks break and call play after the drinks break? This question is from Ramesh. Uh, Ramesh. If you want to go strictly according to the law, yes. As uh, drinks is a scheduled interval, so at the start of the scheduled interval, you need to call uh, time and drinks, and after the after the um, the drinks interval, you need to call play according to the law. What, what I do know in practice, it doesn't happen. Uh, the uh, lots of umpires when it's drinks interval. They call over and drinks, and um, on the resumption of drinks interval, I've heard some. When everyone's ready, the first ball then just gets bowled. But technically, according to the law, you need to call time at the at um, at the um, start of the um, drinks interval. And um, sorry, when. When you're going to take the drink interval, you need to call over and time and drinks, and you need to call play um, on resumption of play after the interval. But yeah, but Tom, in practice, uh, uh, lots of guys don't don't do it. Correct, Abdullah. Um, similar to in most matches, when the winning runs are hit, uh, law tells us that at the end of a match you should call time, but um, I think players are celebrating and mm. running all over the field. Um, I've never called time for the end of a match unless it's a drawn more day yeah. match. Correct. Uh, uh, the same to me, Tom. I've, I've, unless it's a draw, uh, otherwise um, I've never called time at the end of the game. Correct. Last question on the chat box before we move to the hands which are have been up for a while. Comes from Temi Tope. When are umpires supposed to check bats with the bat gauge? Dula, do you want to go for that? So at international level, this gets done prior to the game. So what happens um, at international level, umpires are usually um, the uh, few days before the time they will then do venue inspections they will also attend net sessions of both sides so if if south africa is practicing uh, two days before the game starts uh, the the on-field umpires um, will go to a net session the um, uh, the ne following day they'll make sure they attend the uh, other side's net session as well so during those net sessions, the other two umpires, the TV as well as the fourth official, will then join them. And the fourth umpire will then, while they're busy practicing, um, walk through through the teams. They'll use they'll go to the 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 teams. They'll ask them, guys, um, are you happy with your with your um, 
with your equipment. Do you want me to check anything? Are you unsure, unsure of anything? Let me rather check it now instead of um, us pointing it out uh, in the game. Um, usually the bats, uh, pads and everything is lying there. They'll, they'll go through, they'll go through them. They'll take their bad gauges, they'll put it, they'll put it through them. So to answer your question, that is where it happens at these uh, net sessions before the, the test match or ODI or T20 uh, starts. Um, nothing stopping the fourth umpire going into the dressing room to with the worth easier or bad gates to to go check it just before the the game starts. Uh, uh, but I but usually it gets done um, at these net sessions before the the start of the test match ODI or T20. Thanks, Dula. Now we move on to hands which have been up for a while. Arabinda, please unmute your microphone and address your question to myself or Abdullah. Uh, no, sir, uh, it's accidentally happened. Okay, must have been up from the Q&A uh, earlier. Thank you. Jitendra, uh, you've also got your hand up. Is that a fresh hand or is that from the revision questions earlier? No, no, yeah, this is a fresh question. Uh, so my question is, uh, I have a doubt, a, a very subtle doubt, very small doubt. The doubt is, if on any day, who determines that there shall be interval for drinks, the umpires or the captains? Good question, Jitendra. You want to take that one, Abdullah? Yeah, yes, I'll take it. Thanks, uh, Jitendra, for your question. Drinks is a scheduled interval gets determined by the governing body before the uh, before the the game uh, starts. Uh, so when in a test match, drinks uh, is in the middle of, of each uh, session. So it starts at 10, let's say lunch is at 12, at 11 o'clock, there will be a scheduled drinks interval. And because it's a scheduled interval, those intervals needs to be taken. Nine out of ten times, they they do or players do take the drinks interval. Yes, there are times that I've seen where drinks gets not uh, doesn't get taken. Uh, I've I've been in a few games where let's say drinks is at eleven o'clock, but at five to or ten to uh, eleven, there's only. Uh, 10 runs at uh, side B needs 10 runs to win or 15 runs to win, close to victory. Uh, the What we usually then do is we ask the fielding captain, captain, drinks is at 11 o'clock. Uh, the um, I see uh, side B still needs 10 runs to win. Do you want to take drinks at 11 o'clock? We'll ask the, the, the batters at the wicket whether they want drinks at 11 o'clock. 99% of the time, seeing that it's so close to a victory, they they say, no, uh, umpire, it's okay, we'll forgo the drinks interval, we'll play uh, until the batting side gets the, the 10 runs. Uh, but in those instances, if one of the, the parties, whether it's the fielding captain or the batters at the wicket, say, yes, they do want the drinks interval at 11 o'clock, even though there's one run or two run or five runs still to, to win, yes, practically it, it looks stupid, but it's a scheduled interval. It was arranged for it to be at 11 o'clock. It's uh, they buy, they buy uh, it's all their right or they buy the means if they want it. We need to take the drinks at 11 o'clock. Did I answer the question, Tom? Yes, it did, Dula. Uh, if I can just thank add thank to you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Jitendra, what sometimes happens in a more day cricket match, um, for example, a test match with a morning session of 10 a.m. to 12 midday, is we have a change of innings at 10.50. Remember that our drinks break should be at 11 a.m. So then we would actually come back onto the field after the 10 minutes interval change at 11 a.m. Are we going to take a drinks break 
straight after change of innings at 11 a.m. Uh, that practically is not very smart use of time. So um, typically what the umpires do is they calculate how much time is left in a session. And if there is less than 90 minutes left in a session, then they usually do not take drinks uh, unless it's an extremely hot and humid day. Uh, if they are between 90 and 150 minutes in a session, then they will take one drinks break. If it's an extended drinks break because, sorry, if it's an extended session because maybe we took an early tea break and uh, so our last session is going to be three hours, for example, maybe we're making up lost time for rain break earlier in the day so we're extending the scheduled close of play uh, then it's not in law and it's not in playing conditions but the uh, general consensus amongst umpires is that if a session is longer than 150 minutes then we shall take two drinks breaks in that session so i think to complete the answer for your question it's can be foregone by the captains, uh, but it is usually scheduled by the umpires in terms of when a drinks break uh, can and should happen. Um, I hope in total we have um, given you a full picture of uh, drinks breaks. Jitendra. Yeah, much, much satisfied. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Great stuff, ladies and gentlemen. I see no further hands have been raised and no further questions have been added to the text box. So I'd like to thank you all for a great start to our level two lectures. Uh, very interactive is what we like to see and have uh, because at the end of the day, it's not Abdullah or I who are going to be writing the level two exam. It's, it's all of you. So great that you are engaging because that is how you learn. We will reconvene next week, Monday, when we shall go through uh, laws 12 until 18, uh, skipping one or two, because as I mentioned, we are not going through every single law. And even the laws that we go through, we are not covering every single aspect of every single law. But thank you once again for your attendance. I will be sending out the recording about an hour or two after this lecture. So for those friends or colleagues of yours who've missed out, they can catch up. And good advice I would suggest is for you to do the revision questions on your own between now and uh, next week, Monday because I will include the questions in the email I'm sending out later tonight. Have a good and safe evening, and we shall meet again on Monday. Great weekend when it comes. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, sir. Bye, everyone.